died. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the other factors influencing that change and change opportunities because a lot of what I'm doing is about um, motivating change in a positive way. So, um, e-prescribing, electronic prescribing, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that to some extent. Um, and some of this I'm sure you've seen in your textbooks. It is, it helps as far as um, ele ele unreadable handwritten prescriptions, um, data entry errors, there are points of failure in handwritten, uh, prescription history checks. Um, there, there's a lot of opportunity with working with the technology to look at what, what your patient history has been as far as the medications that they're using and how they're um, involved in the prescription process. Um, and then, of course, there are opportunities within EHRs. If you're using an EHR to prescribe, you don't necessarily have to have an EHR to use e-prescribing. Um, but you can set alerts and such in that to actually help you to, to uh, recognize opportunities to catch adverse drug events or um, problems that could be developing. Um, there's also medication adherence, patient adherence. We found that with e-prescribing, um, on your first fill, about you get about 10% more of your um, uh, patients actually will get their prescriptions filled if it's e-prescribed versus a paper prescription that maybe gets lost in a book or 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 de a decision is made at some point. Um, it removes one step or point of failure. Actually, I was thinking about that later. It actually removes multiple points or steps of failure just in removing that one step because you start losing a lot of opportunities not only for loss, stolen, um, opportunities to miss key information, etc. So by removing that paper from it, you actually remove several points of failure, which are opportunities for somebody to end up quite bad off or otherwise. Um, also, it builds a more complete medication history. You're actually tracking your your you have data now that is is um, structured instead of some kind of an unstructured form that is being translated back and forth. Um, Efficiency. Efficiency is, is, is fascinating. Um, it reduces time with pharmacy prescriber calls. If anybody has been in a practice or a pharmacy waiting for a prescription, just watch and see how many calls constantly. They are constantly on the phone trying to sort these things out. Um, if it's computerized, then that eliminates that, that problem. Um, it creates opportunities for generics to be more easily recognized and seen. Um, it's easier to adhere to a Pierce formulary. Um, it's extremely frustrating to be a patient, to, to get to the pharmacy and find out that what has been prescribed by your physician is not actually covered by your plan. And so then you open up a whole new can of worms in the process of that. And again, it eliminates that point of failure. Um, it reduces patient wait time at the pharmacy. That's a, that makes everybody happier. And then um, it's also a way of meeting meaningful use. Um, within the EHR incentive program, within Medicaid, Medicaid still is um, going through the um, three stages of meaningful use. You may have be familiar with Medicare having transitioned to some to some new um, um, uh, uh, programs and things of that nature. But Medicaid is still going through meaningful use, um, and so with that, there is a requirement to um, do a certain amount of e-prescribing. So this also helps to meet that, and in the process of that, helps to meet meaningful use of EHR systems. So um, e-prescribing in Texas actually launched um, back in um, 2009 with House Bill 1966, where the um, legislature said, hey, let's, let's start looking at what's it going to take to get e-prescribing in place. And um, so a plan was put together by Medicaid and, and CMS, um, with HHSC, I mean. And then in um, 2011, uh, the technology to make that happen was actually um, put into place. The, as, as you can imagine, it wasn't just a, a simple throw of a switch. There was a lot of figuring out how that would integrate as far as the pharmaceuticals and the, and the um, vendor drug program and all of these things. The benefits of it actually have, have accrued um, between 2012 and 14, there was two and a half million dollars in federal and state funds saved, and that was from errors that were avoided um, improved use of generics, um, compliance with the preferred drug list, and uh, fewer prescriptions. Needless prescriptions were written, um, probably less duplication. 
Okay, um, in this chart here, this is really kind of fascinating. Um, you can see here, I'm going to use my pointer a little bit, we're looking at about 44, 45%. This is what e-prescribing has done over the period of this, which is from the start of the program to 2014. You see a nice steady rise. You're starting to see a little bit of plateauing up here. Um, this is within the Medicaid system, not within all of e-prescribing, but this is within Texas Medicaid. And um, it's not unusual to see this sort of a plateau. As you see a lot of conversion. Conversion takes off quickly, then it slows a little bit, and then it starts to stabilize. Down here is e-prescribing a controlled substance. As you can see, it's just kind of clunking along. Nowhere it's had that same. Um, it has not. It it did not start as at the same time that e-prescribing did, and I'll talk about that a little bit a little later. But um, the, the important point is is that we are not seeing an uptake on it as we are with e-prescribing. Here, this is within the Meaningful Use Program um, versus those physicians who are not within the Meaningful Use Program. You can see, um, and some of you may have attended the seminar that um, my colleagues did for Medicaid about a month ago, and they have the same slide, but you can see um, that e-prescribing back in 2011, within the EHR incentive program, we had 36%, and then we were up to 49%, and then 63%. And those down here, who are all the other physicians who are not in the EHR incentive program within Medicaid, you know, we're looking at a much lower uptake on that: 13%, 20%, 25%. And that's how we end up with our average of about 44, 45%. Is this comparison between those who are early adopters, I, I don't know if I call them early adopters, but those who are accepting the, the, the transition, the change to using technology in their practice, and those who are maybe starting to, to use it to somewhat, or some early adopters within that. And uh, I think this is kind of fascinating over here also, is that within the program, you, you see a, l a, a lot more um, uh, consistent, or not consistent, but just continued use of e-prescribing. So we're seeing a change and a transition in how physicians are, are doing prescribing. Here, this is another slide. Um, this shows uh, change over time. Um, and again, this downward slope, this is um, indicative of change that you start off with a lot more change and then it gradually uh, tapers off a little bit. But what's most fascinating are these spikes. And what we're seeing is that right near the point in time when um, attestation requirements require uh, the reporting. We're seeing sort of what I call a, a night before your finals rush. The, you're seeing that the practices are, are sort of going, oh my god, we are nowhere near the amount of e-prescribing that we need to be doing to meet our attestation. Okay, we better get on this. Everybody start e-prescribing fast now. And you see this spike. And we can see this when we start to look at data. Now, I'm going to take just a second to step back and say, okay, we talk all the time about EHRs and we talk about analysis and analytics and how these things can be used in a practice setting and looking at patients and looking at um, your public health. That's exactly what we're doing here. Realize that the continuum of health IT is a patient and that what we are looking at here is a symptom. Okay, data is showing us a symptom of the transition, of the change, the process. Again, I'm challenging you to think a little differently than what you think about health IT. In order to make health IT happen, it's not a bunch of electronic boxes and wires and software and things like that. It's people and choices and decisions to use tools. That's what really are factors in this. And it's stuff like legislation, policy, and impediments that you probably aren't going to touch on a lot. But when you get out there, you, you, you start to get into these things, and these are, these are critical factors. And so within workflow, you're not seeing it being incorporated into workflow. Why not? What is, what's the cause of that? Um, okay, so as I was saying, um, we're looking at about 44% within Medicaid in terms of um, e-prescribing. Nationally, according to SureScripts, we're at about 57% e-prescribing across the nation. Um, Texas is a whole with Medicare and Medicaid and those who are using other, uh, any and all e-prescribing, about 53%, which lags behind the nation. And then, of course, like I said, Medicaid is lagging behind that. So 
you know, this is this is kind of sad, and I think it's a lot of room for change in that. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about uh, drugs, opioid abuse, things like this. These are um, sad but true facts, and there's a ton of this material out there. This has hit mainstream. Media loves this kind of stuff. As soon as you start to show a, a problem, you know, as they say in media, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. Well, this is the kind of stuff that you get. This is doom and gloom, but this does not necessarily tell us how to change these things. That's actually up to some of what we're endeavoring to do. Um, so 6.2 million American adults are using prescription drugs non-medically. Um, there's 1.2 million emergency room visits involved in non-medical use of prescriptions, um, ED visits. And this is kind of fascinating that people over 65 um, have, have climbed by 50% uh, from misuse of, of um, pharmaceuticals in, in that time period. And then also um, people who are 65 and older, we've seen a 12% increase in that five-year period for people 65 and older. So again, uh, a population trend. Why is that happening? What is going on here? Um, it's not just about you know young people misusing opioids and drugs and things like that, prescriptions. It's, it's um, actually cross-population. Um, society costs, we're looking at 55 billion, 55 and a half billion dollars. That's not only in medical, but that's in terms of lost productivity, work loss, that's in terms of justice system, criminal system, prosecuting, huge, huge impact on, on society and community these, that these um, uh, prescription uh, misuse is causing. Um, uh, interestingly, opioid pain reliever deaths four times higher than heroin and cocaine. That surprised me. Um, also, opioid abuse is ten times higher in the Medicaid population, hence one of the reasons that Medicaid is so interested in this. Um, opioid prescriptions, again, for people 65 and older in 2013 increased 20% in five years. And then about one out of every 12 high school seniors um, has admitted to non-medical use of, of these medications. So it's pretty, it's pretty prevalent across all age groups and across the, in the entire population out there. Um, so, so where are they getting the medications from? You would think it's from drug dealers. Well, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Um, 27% are from physicians. Um, this here is kind of interesting and surprising, but not. Friends and family, either buying or giving, represent over 50% of, of where people are getting their medications. Um, you know, hey, can you, can you lend me a couple pain pills? I'm not feeling well. Or here, take some of this. This will help you or whatever. I read an article the other day about the use of a medication to sort of uh, help with studying. It's an ADHD medication, and students are taking this to sort of help them to um, improve performance. So, um, you know, we're seeing, and this, of course, this is within the chronic uh, users, and then this is within just the infrequent users. Uh, somebody stubs their toe or something like that. Um, and again, we're seeing this friends and family are where a lot of these are coming from, but that gets into tracking and other things like that that we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, drug fraud. Um, the Government Accountability Office found tens of thousands of potential Medicaid controlled substance fraud and abuse purchases in these uh, five states, including Texas. Uh, 63 million was paid for doctor shopping. That's where you take a prescription to this pharmacy and you take a similar one to this pharmacy and this one, etc. Um, I'm always fascinated personally when I go to my particular pharmacy chain and the same pharmacy here does not know what my prescription is over here across town. They're not even talking among themselves within their own um, facilities, let alone between each other. It makes it easy. Um, and if you make it easy, you, you know, you can, you got to expect there are people out there who are going to take advantage of that. Um, 1,800 prescriptions were filled for pharmacies for dead Medicaid clients. Um, I don't think they probably got a lot of use out of those. Uh, Two million was paid uh, to practitioners of pharmacies who had been barred or excluded. So we're seeing a lot of fraud within, within the uh, prescription drug fraud. Um, this is also something that's kind of interesting. This is a high-intensity drug trafficking. Um, right down here, I marked Beaumont. Uh, Southeast Texas Medical Association, um, this is Dr. Holly and his group over there. They have, and um, I'm going to get this wrong. I have it in my slide later. I want to say 44 providers. Four, four physicians um, 
but they have completely um, they have gotten they have completely gone over to using e-prescribing controlled substance at this point in time. Um, these high um, drug trafficking areas, you can see obviously the Houston area. Uh, you can see a lot of that here. But look at you've got um, large areas here, here. These are all areas, but only this only this um, practice here, to my knowledge, has implemented that. And I'm probably going to get emails saying, and I hope I do, because it would actually be kind of interesting to know who else is using EPCS out there to to fight this this sort of drug trafficking that's going on. I, I'm very um, encouraged by by that sort of uh, proactive um, use of the tools that we have to to tackle a very important problem. Um, this this here is just a little information about about um, HITA. Um, you know, we about four million dollars was allocated to, uh, into these regions to fight it. Um, the uh, the areas actually developed their own strategies, and uh, and again, um, Setma uh, is incorporating this as well as I'm sure other strategies to to combat this problem within their area. Uh, 42 physicians. I, I was close. Um, in six clinics, uh, they have gone through the process of enabling all of them to do e-prescribing a controlled substance. Um, could EPCS be working in some of those other areas that, that you could see on the map there? Very likely. Um, so, all right. Um, some, of the, some of what they incorporated in the process of migrating over to EPCS, they did a six-month, I'm calling it a test pilot, but they, they seem to, they took a small group of their physicians and they developed a core competency uh, within their <laughs> provider community sort of to start to test the water and to develop a proficiency with EPCS. They didn't just kind of throw it out there or say, hey, y'all should be doing this. They actually embraced the, the, the process of change. Um, they created an online EPCS tutorial. They, um, they sent out a letter alerting, I, again, proactive, proactive. I love this. They sent a letter to all their pharmacies that they're prescribing to. said, hey, folks, we're going to be sending these over to you. If you want our business, we need you all to be able to process these because if the pharmacy picks up the phone and goes, and this, believe me, this does happen. Um, what is if, you know? We're, we're, we we don't do EPCS. That's not allowed. That's illegal. There, I actually could show you evidence of pharmacies that even though they're 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 capable, it doesn't mean that every human being within them knows this. So this sort of proactive moves the ball forward. Um, they they even communicate a refill policy to their patients and providers. They wrote it out. They said, Hey, folks, you're our patients. You're going to comply with these particular things that we expect these of you. We're in this together. Let's make this happen. Um, and then they built um, a dashboard uh, within their EHR to actually assist their providers with reminders and monitorings as far as EPCS and all that. I mean, see the, see the system here. See the process. It, it's not just about this abstract EPCS. They developed an entire strategy that makes it workable. And then they implement it across their their their, um, their practice. That's that's how you get things done. Um, here's another way to get things done. You pass legislation, and you make it required. Um, New York, I stop. Um, they passed the law and said you everybody will e-prescribe and everybody will do EPCS. I don't think that's going to work in Texas. I think the the pushback would 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 be staggering. But um, here you can see they right now are leading the nation in terms of 27%. Uh, just by reference, Texas is about 5% right now um, in terms of EPCS. And then their pharmacies are at 93%. We're at about 85%. So they are the leader within the nation in terms of e-prescribing of controlled substances and e-prescribing. But again, this is because it, was, it, it is now a law in New York that you must do this. And I think there are some things as far as exceptions, et cetera, et cetera, and that gets into a whole other aspect of it. And I'm not here to analyze New York. But uh, New York, um, here they also, with their, um, with their PDMP, uh, their monitoring, PDMP used in conjunction with e-prescribing controlled substance is a nice one-two punch because it allows physicians to look back and see or look at who's prescribing what and when and how and all of this. It, it provides information, again, in New York, required by law, not required by law here in Texas. Um, so what are PDMPs? 
All right, PDMPs, they collect and monitor and analyze um, prescribing information and dispensing data um, that's used to support education, research, law enforcement, and abuse prevention. 49 states, including Guam, also uh, all have a PDMP in place, including Texas. Um, most states allow practitioners and pharmacists to get PDMP reports on patients who are under their care. And then uh, PDMPs uh, monitor schedule two through, uh, two through four uh, uh, prescriptions and uh, that contain narcotics and things like that. So it, in, in essence, it's a way to look at who is who who has been prescribed uh, these controlled substances. Um, so uh, the Office of National Coordinator um, actually noted that um, um, that PD PDMPs help clinicians to, uh, to identify and intervene and curb prescription drug abuse. And again, this sort of just reinforces what I was saying. Um, it can help clinicians distinguish between patients who need an opioid medication and those who may be seeking to misuse it. Um, Many clinicians typically don't use PDMP because they have been cumbersome and time consuming. This is from the ONC. And again, this is going back, I'm going to loop once more back to human factors. What are the influencers on uptake of these technologies? Uh, pilot projects have shown that using PDMP with EHR increases, increases use and does demonstrate value, um, clinical value. Um, and then using those two together is, is certainly a, a very effective way to uh, address uh, usage. Um, so back in 2012, the DPS launched um, um, PAT, which is Prescription Access in Texas, to which is our PDMP here in Texas. Um, this is sort of a, a little bit of an overview of PAT as we are right now. Uh, Texas Medical Association, TMA, um, had an article back in 2015 that described it as unwieldy spreadsheets that physicians had to search for patients to fill who had filled similar prescriptions. Um, again, human factor here. Now, there's also comments from physicians out there who say, hey, it's not that bad. I think it's like anything. If you use it for a while, it becomes more familiar to you. Um, that's not to say it doesn't perhaps have issues with its functionality and usability. Um, PAT at that point in time, and I think still does not connect with electronic medical records. Um, in 2014, the Senate House uh, recommended improvements to PAT, so obviously they felt like there was some need um, to improve the system itself and to fight diversion. And um, PAT was moved from DPS over to the Texas State Board of Pharmacy to actually govern um, the, uh, the PDMP here in Texas. Um, the TSBP wants PAT to focus on helping doctors and pharmacists make better decisions. There, there I, I was reading a comment um, by by them and it said, you know, we're we're here to help patients. I mean, yes, it's, this can be used for law enforcement, but that is that's not our focus. We want PDMP to to help people um, have access to the prescriptions they need and to do do what they can do to use this tool to be effective in a medical setting. Um, TSBP is working on upgrades that could include alerts. Um, right now, the system does not send an alert to physician, does not say, hey, this prescription, this uh, patient of yours has gotten a prescription for this medication. My understanding is that they are working on getting that in place. I believe that they are in the process of um, doing procurement and things like that and working on, on getting their system to or getting PAT to be um, more of what they would like it to be. So, um, and I, I, that's a little bit conjecture. This was, that was a couple months ago. I know that they were at least focused on that at that point in time. Um, okay, so let's look a little bit. This is uh, Texas Medicaid EPCS use, EPCS controlled substance. Um, these are all the all the controlled substance prescriptions that were written within this period of time, um, which was um, October of 2014, one month. Um, here is e-prescribing, and um, as you can see, it's way down here. Most are still written by hand of all the controlled substances out there. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, 85% of the pharmacies in Texas can accept e-prescribing, EPCS. 
Uh, we're at about 5%, 5.3 is what the last number I saw from SureScripts. Um, continuing to work to push that up. Um, interestingly, within Medicaid, looking at the data, um, less than 2% of uh, Texas Medicaid controlled substance claims were actually uh, actually used EPCS. So even though 5% of the providers are enabled for EPCS in Texas within Medicaid, less than 2% are actually actually did any claims at all or used EPCS at all. Um, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, e-prescribing started out back in 2011. EPCS, or e-prescribing controlled substance, actually started in 2013 in October. It went through a period of testing and, 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 and sort of uh, uh, vetting it. And then in about, I think it was about March of 2014, it actually started to actually go into applied use out there in the community. So it is somewhat new. We're about two years into using EPCS in Texas. Um, a great resource to know about and understanding EPCS is um, SureScripts has set up getEPCS.com um, online. It's, it's um, an agnostic website that um, tells you a lot about EPCS, um, explains it. Um, it identifies um, certified EPCS systems, both standalone software and EHRs. Yeah, there's a typo. Uh, find, uh, you can find the Texas pharmacies that accept EPCS and list them, um, and you can also find providers using EPCS. I thought that was really neat, that they actually have a directory of, of both pharmacies and providers who use EPCS. So if you're a patient who is looking to find somebody who's doing that or want to refer somebody, that's where you can find that. And then they also have videos and other tools to, to help um, understand EPCS. <coughs> and they also go into the four steps that are required for a provider to, to do EPCS. Um, just real quickly, some of the benefits of EPCS, reduce risk, overprescribing is easier to spot, doctor shopping I mentioned earlier can be seen more quickly, there's no paper pads to be stolen, altered or forged, um, it prevents non-legitimate pharmacy calls when they can't be confirmed like late in the evening, prevents altered pharmacy record diversion, we'd like to think everybody's honest but they're not, um, reduces risk of provider identity theft, there are there are providers who are writing prescriptions across the state who actually are not writing prescriptions. There are people who are who are pretending to be them, and this is happening right now. Um, monitoring a patient use over time is easier. It makes it harder for patients to sell their sell or share their drugs. And then it's also um, if if the DEA or anybody wants to know what you're doing in your practice, this is a this is a nice way to have a a, a computerized record of exactly what you're doing with your controlled substances. Um, it has all the benefits of e-prescribing that we talked about earlier, but it also reduces trips and travel time for patients, so you don't have to run to your, for your uh, physician to get triplicates. Um, my wife was going through dental surgery. I was really annoyed to, at 7 o'clock in the morning, have to drive you know, an hour up to, up to the physician's office get there, find out that they'd left their pad at home because they just moved their office, had to go back another time to get the triplicate from them. I griped at them about, why are you not doing EPCS? She went in the back room, talked to their vendor. Turns out they were already set up to do EPCS. They didn't even know they could do EPCS. And they, e and they were able to e-prescribe my controlled substance over that in a, in a, while I was in their office. So it, it's, it's an interesting situation out there. There's, there's some education and other things. So um, reducing trips for your, for your uh, frustrated patients is, is, I think, a real important key factor in that. A free time spent. This, I, the, this kind of occurred to me while I was sitting back thinking about this. Every time a provider has to schedule a patient on their schedule to come in and get a triplicate blocks out a chunk of time. That's another patient could be being seen. They have to meet with that patient. They have to, or somebody does, write out the prescription there, hand it to them. How much time is lost in all of this going in there, not only for the patient, but for the physician? How much efficiency can be gained by getting rid of a lot of wasted office calls? Um, reduces the anxiety. This is Dr. Holly over at Setman told me about this. He had to prescribe a prescription for a patient on a weekend. Um, typically, this would have been a problem. 
But for him, it took him all of two minutes because they were signing up for doing EPCS. He said, it's amazing. It's so comforting to not have the anxiety of how do I get this medication to my patient, to be able to just go up here, do it, and it's done. Um, and then, of course, single workflow. You've got your, your non-controlled substances, be prescribed, and, and now you've got your controlled substances. So it's all being handled through a digital format. Um, so you can narrow your workflow that way. All right, so how does a physician um, get in, uh, become enabled to do EPCS? Um, there's four steps. Again, I'll go through this real quickly. Um, first of all, you've got to find out whether your EHR actually is, has a module for EPCS. Not all EHRs have an EPCS module. Um, get EPCS.com. They list those that have it. You can search, sort it. Um, and also, uh, you can talk to your vendor if you have an EHR. Um, be proactive. Call up your vendor and say, "Hey, um, I had a I had a practice contact me and uh, how do we do APCS?" I I asked them what their EHR was. I called their EHR vendor and said, um, "You show that you do APCS. Your practice over here doesn't know that you do APCS. You might want to give them a call." Um, and so you know, it's 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 being proactive and 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 reaching out. And then if there's no EHR. Um, there are standalone solutions. Here's just a quick screen grab from the uh, Get EPCS uh, uh, website. You can see that over here you can filter and sort by different things such as um, EPCS, um, whether it's a standalone solution, etc. You can see the column here for EPCS um, in terms of which system had blocked out the vendors because I'm not here to do a commercial. And um, But you can go out there and you can see just which systems actually are, are capable, and, and most of the major ones are, um, but there also are uh, in, uh, some that are not, and interesting, interesting ones. Um, so step two, go through identity proofing. Um, you got to answer uh, questions, email copies of documents, photo, medical license, all of that. It has to be actually done by the provider. They can't farm it out to somebody else to handle. Uh, and it's a time-consuming step, and it can feel privacy invasive. These are all comments I've heard physicians make. Um, it's not something that's fun. I've, I've been told that it's not, it's not that um, um, horrible, but that it, it certainly is not something that you seek out to, to, um, um, to that, that you would want to do more than you have to. Um, but. And then um, your EPCS vendor, I keep coming back to that, your vendor is there to help with this. You've paid for your system. They are there to work with you to make that happen. Um, step three, you got to, uh, your vendor would then help you to acquire two-factor authentication. Um, can be a mobile phone where you enter the um, software to do the EPCS. It sends a number to your phone. Your phone gives you that number, the app, you type the number in, and you go from there. If you don't have um, good uh, cell reception in that area, it could be a problem, so you may want to have an alternate process in place, um, depending upon where you practice. Um, if you practice at multiple locations, you might need multiple forms of uh, two-factor authentication, a couple different fobs, etc. You might want to have a backup fob in case you lose it. However, in the process of that, do you also create a, a potential point of risk by the, the possibility that you could lose that. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of think about what works for what works for that particular physician and their situation. What is the most effective, least disruptive way for them to interact with the EPCS uh, solution? Um, and then you, the final step is basically confirming that this person actually is the person that they say they are, and that involves another person saying this person is who they say they are, and again, the vendor will help with that. So those are the four steps to get set up for EPCS. Um, just some things that are good to know. It could take several weeks. Um, there may be costs, depending upon the, the vendor who is supplying it. Um, not all EHRs are certified for EPCS. Um, EPCS. The EPCS solution will generate a log of two years, preceding two years, um, it's required to do that. It's sortable at least by patient name, drug name, and date of issuance. And then also it's, it's running an internal audit um, and daily. And if you're a logical access control person, uh, the administrator of that um, finds uh, a 
problem with the data, then they are required to contact the EPCS vendor DEA within one business day. So it's, it's actually um, uh, some maintenance involved with it as well. Um, all right, this is, to me, this is actually kind of the fun part. Um, this is where I start to look at what's going on within Medicaid and the system. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? What, what have we got left? About 15 minutes? Okay. All right, so I took um, 13,000 of those patients who are, have got the most complex, uh, uh, difficult conditions and are, like I said, about 60% of the cost. I asked our analytics team, who are the physicians who are um, treating them? I came up with 19,500 providers, and then of that, 11,700 that I'm calling prescriber group um, actually prescribe medications. So with that, what I, what I learned as I started to slice and dice the data is that 65% of that 11,000 prescriber group actually e-prescribed, 43% um, prescribed Schedule II medications, 76% of the prescriber group prescribing Schedule II medications also e-prescribed non-controlled substances. So they are, 76% are prescribing non-controlled and, um, and also prescribing controlled but not necessarily um, e-prescribing controlled. 4% of that prescriber, prescriber group are using EPCS for the controlled substances. 4% of the controlled substances sent by that prescriber group are using EPCS. And then interestingly, I just thought I'd cross reference with the Medicaid EHR incentive program just to see, and 36% um, of that prescriber group are in the Medicaid EHR incentive program, of which 58% of them actually have attested for meaningful use. Um, and again, I would note this does not include all Texas Medicaid providers. I was looking at a very specific sample group, which are those who are the providers dealing with those patients with most complex conditions. Um, interestingly, this I found very fascinating, the 10%, the 80-20 rule, I didn't do 20, I did 10, 10% of the prescriber group, what, what I'm calling the top S2, uh, prescribe 64% of the Schedule II controlled substance. So, in other words, I've got about 4,000 prescribers who are doing controlled substance prescriptions, of which 460 are doing 64% of the controlled substance. And if you actually distill that down to practices instead of providers, you're actually looking at a smaller number. You're looking at a smaller number of practice groups that are actually the lion's share, 60 some odd percent of the controlled substance of those patients who represent 60% of the spend or a large percentage of the spend within the Medicaid system. So in essence, this little tip of the tail over here is actually shaking this big dog over here. Really fascinating. 92% um, of the prescriber group um, uh, of, that, of that top, I'm just going to say 460 prescribers, actually do use e-prescribing. So most of them are e-prescribing. 51% of that um, top S2 are in the um, EHR incentive, Medicaid EHR incentive program. 73% of the S2 group have attested to meaningful use. 85% of the EHRs that are being used by the S2, and again, like I said, 15% of these EHRs are not capable of doing EPCS, but 85% are capable of doing EPCS, so it's not the technology holding most of them back from using it. And then 8% of the S2 group um, who are meaningful users use EPCS. Here it is, uh, a little more drawn out as a graphic, just it make it a little bit easier to see. So um, this, is, this is where I'm working on at the moment. Uh, we are actually going back and working with our analytics people to actually go into all of our provider group. I actually started up here with um, treating managed clients, which are those with the complex conditions. So this, this chart is, a, is actually a, a little bit um, um, Cross integrated, um, but anyway. So in distilling out the data, I looked at who who could prescribe, or who is prescribing, who is prescribing controlled substance. That's why I call critical factors. You know, they're active. They have actually filed a claim within the last year. They're not just, you know, not just um, in the system. And then they're prescribing and they're prescribing controlled substances. So I consider those critical factors. And then um, these are indicators to me. You know, are, uh, where I was looking at are the, those with complex conditions. Are they e-prescribing? 
do they have an EHR or the, in the incentive program? Who are the top ones within that, and are they doing EPCS? And I see the change areas here where we can increase e-prescribers in general. Like I said, we're looking at about 44% within Texas that are e-prescribing, and we can change here EPCS, which is about 5%. So just sort of a graphic representation. Um, this, the biggest Schedule II prescribers, I, we have many, many children in Medicaid programs. So not surprisingly, 32% uh, are pediatric, 16% are general family, um, internal medicine's 10, and psychiatry, neurology, emergency medicine, and surgery. Are, those are the main ones who are, um, who are prescribing controlled substances. Okay, um, this is another factor. And this is one of the things I was talking about. Other factors. This is pharmacy. This is what I was talking about earlier. Just because pharmacy says they're enabled and capable doesn't necessarily mean that they are. Um, for example, here you can see, okay, here's a pharmacy. They had 35 uh, uh, controlled substance claims, and eight of which were they, they filled using EPCS or came in through EPCS. And again, some of this is a factor of the physicians. If the physicians aren't sending, the pharmacies aren't filling. However, and I, and I accept that. However, Here's a pharmacy with 434 controlled substance claims and zero are EPCS. That to me doesn't make sense. Here's 200 and zero. Um, you're, you're seeing inconsistencies. Here's 356 just by comparison with 11, 318, 19. This is one particular pharmacy chain. This is, this is um, I'm just calling it Bob's Pharmacy or pharmacy number six. You know, there are multiple large chains across the state. If you look at the data, they all reflect this same sort of inconsistent behavior, which tells me, again, at a human labor level, behavior level, we're not seeing the uptake within their um, utilization of EPCS at the pharmacy level. Even though they're capable, just because they have the toy doesn't necessarily mean they play with it. Okay, They need to um, um, somehow or other start to... Uh, improve this, if that's possible. Um, okay, uh, this was uh, New York, also uh, health literacy, patient literacy, a uh, practice we were talking to, they want to e-prescribe. They are happy to e-prescribe. They want to do EPCS. Their patients are going, we want handwritten. Okay, uh, we'll send it over to your pharmacy. No, give me my paper, okay. This is a factor. This is a factor that's influencing it. Here in New York, they actually are doing outreach to, to um, help patients understand the, uh, the benefits of e-prescribing to them. So again, influencing human behavior. Um, so looking at opportunities, this is going back to the data, looking at, I showed you what is being done. Well, here's where there are gaps. You know, 35% of the prescriber group do not e-prescribe. Why are they not e-prescribing? 24% uh, of the prescriber group are prescribing controlled substance, but not e-prescribing. And 8% of the top 10% um, do not e-prescribe. 96% uh, of the prescriber group who, um, um, who are prescribing Schedule II um, uh, is 96% of the prescriptions for Schedule II prescribed by the prescriber group are still handwritten. So even though they have EPCS, 96% of all their controlled substances are still being handwritten, even though they have EPCS in place to do it, and they're using it. Why are they not doing it for the other 96%? And then 94% of the Schedule II uh, prescribers, and this is not that top 10%, this is the whole 4,000 some odd, 94% um, of the uh, Schedule II prescribers that e-prescribe, I'm sorry, I take it back. This is the this is the four percent who are using EPCS. Ninety-four percent of the prescribers in that prescriber group that e-prescribe do not use EPCS. So of those who are using EPCS, most of the prescriptions they're writing are not EPCS. Those that are e-prescribing are not using EPCS. So we've got some interesting behavior changes. Um, I feel like a lot of times with my work it's not so much getting at answers as getting at better questions. It seems like the deeper I dig, the more questions I come up with. And that's what I've been sort of uh, alluding to through some of this. You know, um, how do the prescribers in the, in the prescriber group um, um, in the Medicaid incentive program, 
Um, okay, sending a program present. How? I'm sorry, I'm sorting out my line. How do you prescribe a group non-Medicaid incentive program to e-prescribe? Okay, so how are they prescribing, in other words? If they are e-prescribing and they're not in the Medicaid EHR incentive program and they have an EHR, we can, we can see those, they have an EHR, how are the others e-prescribing? Are they in the Medicare program? Are they using standalone solutions? What are they doing? Because what that correlates into is cross cross-matching that data and saying, okay, uh, Bob's EHR over here, did you know that you have this many of these type of physicians who are perhaps not e-prescribing, et cetera? It gives you the big picture. Right now, only looking at the Medicaid data, I only have part of the picture. I want to know what the rest of the picture is as much as I can. What is the landscape out there? Um, how does this analysis compare to all the active Medicaid providers? I looked at one chunk of that those who are dealing with complex conditions, the, the, the most uh, difficult conditions. Um, what's preventing the EPCS users from using more? Like I said, they've got it in place. Why are 96% of prescriptions they're prescribing not EPCS? What is preventing e-prescribers from more use? I mean, they're e-prescribing, but why is there still that gap? Why are 44% are e-prescribing within the Medicaid system? Well, what about the other 56%? Why are they not doing just regular e-prescribing of non-controlled substance? Um, what's preventing them? And, you know, how much do different influencers impact those decisions? Um, their staff, the patients, as I mentioned earlier, with health literacy, the community. Um, how important are these factors in determining whether a physician does or doesn't? Um, just, I... This is a sort of extra credit kind of thing. 89% of Texas Medicaid providers um, are, are still not doing medication history checks. It's typically a simple function in their EHR to actually go over and look to see what, med what the medication history is before they prescribe. We can actually look at the data and say, okay, they prescribed this medication on state. Did they check within a couple of days of this to ever see uh, for perhaps is this patient who's taking this medication also taking this medication and it could cause a seizure or whatever and 89% of them are not doing that to, to avoid ADEs. Um, that's, that's, that's a very important piece right there that, that is tied to e-prescribing but is a different sort of a different aspect of all of this. Um, some of the things that I'm doing to, to create change out there. I've got a monthly statewide call with about 20 stakeholder groups across the state who are working uh, together. We're coming together um, to stay informed of efforts. We're leveraging off of each other's opportunities to, to encourage, particularly e-prescribing controlled substance. We're doing collaborations on initiatives, uh, webinars, and, and trade shows, and different things like that. Um, and also to identify and empower leaders. I want to know who out there is making change, who they are, and I want to work with them. I want to do everything I can to help them continue to help us move this forward. Um, leveraging existing resources, handouts at the practices. I've got different um, groups who are um, going out and handing out materials to providers. That's just getting started. Webinars, newsletters, event handouts, vendor outreach, uh, uh, Pfizer um, mentioned on one of the calls that they would be willing to have some of their reps handing out some of these materials, um, certainly getting some of the EHR vendors um, involved with it. Uh, presentations such as this to help people understand the value. Um, we have a new health IT website that also has a section on EPCS with a lot of information and just things like that that are existing resources. Advertising, I'm working on a public awareness campaign. Um, that will involve an agency doing outreach. Um, got a new ad starting in May with Texas Medicine um, on EPCS. Uh, direct mail brochure is going to be doing a bunch of direct mail out with that um, and letters. Um, we've talked about maybe even some broadcast um, media as well as some social media. Uh, client health literacy, um, brochures, posters, videos, things like that we've talked about, thought about, and then also um, even looked at performance improvement projects, things like that to create financial incentives for change. So what can we do to increase awareness, increase engagement, and um, motivate that kind of change? And I just leave you with a thought that health information, health information technology is about change leadership. 
we again talk a lot about EHRs and technology and all of that, but really at the end of the day, what we're doing is moving from horse and buggy into motorized vehicles and endeavoring to shift an entire paradigm and all the attached artifacts and all the entrenched ideas and all of that within any of the continuums that you work within, you are a change management leader. You are somebody who actually can affect change and we need to make that change um, uh, it, it, um, something that is, is infected, that, that, is, that is out there, that is, um, that, that is something of, that carries along, has passed along and shared. So anyway, questions? Absolutely, um, and you're actually talk, talking about a couple of things besides age. Um, yes, I, within this data, we're not looking at age. There's a lot of literature that actually has been written on that, and you're actually seeing um, a lot of physicians who are near retirement age and otherwise, from discussions I've had with the regional extension centers, and the, that these physicians are saying, that's it, I'm out of it, I'm out of practice, I'm not going to mess with the technology, I don't care to, to change at this point in life. That's happening, you're going to have that sort of shakeout within any industry, within any transition. Um, and yes, of course, those people who are younger, who have grown up with um, uh, technology, who, who the ones who are sitting around constantly on their cell phone, um, they're going to be more willing to embrace the technology. Um, workflow is another issue that you're talking about. And I think that's a whole other discussion in that those, those points of um, transference and the processes and the things like that, is that the best way to handle that situation, what you described? Or could perhaps other methods be applied to make that more efficient and effective? Obviously, there are practices out there who are achieving phenomenal success with these systems and their proponents for it. There's actually a podcast out on the TMA website. Um, I had an opportunity to work with Texas Health Steps and we brought together four physicians who'd been using EHR systems for the last couple of years and they were excited about it. They were excited about the analysis and the things that they were doing that the tools had now allowed them to, to utilize. Um, if you talk with somebody like Dr. Lackman, who um, is up at Parkland, um, he's doing some phenomenal work with asthma and, and the analysis of data and things like that. So as your population whoever these are, and obviously you've got early initiators, the leadership, show what can be done with it and develop the most logical ways to use it, the best of practice, then that's going to start to remediate some of the problems within the system. You know, this is, you know, I mentioned Dr. Brooks is out with her students and challenging them to look at problems in new ways and situations in new ways. Same thing I said earlier, is the challenge is on us to look at all these things in new ways as well because the more we can evolve the process and make it functional, the more likely they'll be for an uptake. Um, I'll go back to uh, early word processors. I don't think there's anybody in this room probably old enough, old as I am, who, who remembers the early word processors. But um, I remember working on WordPerfect in its first incarnation and the darn thing would crash every 30 seconds. I, I, was, I was recently out of the bachelor's program I was in and I was working at a library and I had to help the patrons to keep using this. It was a nightmare, but are we using word processors now? Do, you know, can you imagine not using a word processor to do your documents? It had to grow, it had to develop, we had to develop proficiencies, the vendors had to see the cost factors and improving it, et cetera, et cetera, and then it developed. So the same thing is happening here with all this. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I think, it's a, I think it's a deep question beyond age. Any other questions? You mentioned incentives. Can you talk a little bit 
more about what kind of intent we're using, how to use go and how that kind of policy level things that can be at stake on the federal level. I can tell you that we are looking into ways to reimburse or um, to to uh, find ways to offset the costs of, of implementing EPCS. Um, these discussions, there there's language within some of the documents. Also, um, recently, uh, um, CMS came down with some new guidance as far as um, health information exchange and motivating uh, improved health information exchange and putting some money on the table as far as that. Um, there are opportunities to develop strategies around that, uh, performance improvement projects where um, a certain percentage of money is um, held for um, the managed care organizations and they can apply um, to, to uh, show performance improvement, to uh, receive some of that money that has been set aside. These kind of things, this is some of the um, aspects I mentioned earlier that I've learned a lot about, that it goes far above and beyond the technology. There, is, there are many complexities of legislative, policy, and um, again, human interaction um, and factors that go into all of this. And, in the process of, say, developing a, a, um, a, a financial um, incentive or something like that, you develop a strategy, you then have to get stakeholder buy-in, you then have to get approvals at multiple levels, and it takes time to move this through government. But once you get that, then it allows you to come back and, and create new tools to help people make that transition. Any other questions? No. 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 APCS is still still pretty wild and woolly. Um, so that one is going to be, I think, motivated more by understanding the social impact of of doing what we can to in to um, uh, uh, intervene with prescription drug usage and also the benefit, the cost benefit to the practice of providing better service to their patients um, and and just some of the other benefits of EPCS. And of course that's process of communicating. Any other questions? Any questions online? Yeah, if anybody wants to send me any questions, there's my email right there. And um Oh, I'm sorry. Am I able to? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> Please jump in here. I don't want to interrupt you earlier. It was actually bothering me too, but yeah. Um, all right, so let's extend that chat window. No, oh, it looks coast is clear. So, <laughs> a couple of people, but no questions. Online participants, this is your final chance to ask a question to our presenter. Thank you all very much.